I don't know um, whether any of you have been watching the COVID inquiry over the last few weeks. Um, I'm sure some of you can't imagine doing anything worse um, than listening to politicians trying to uh, justify their actions. However, I've got to admit that as I've tuned in a bit, I found myself feeling a little sorry for those who were in positions of authority in February 2020. For whether it be ministers, civil servants, or scientists, it's absolutely clear that they were all overwhelmed by the challenge of the pandemic. Uh, Boris insisted this week that everyone did their level best in the circumstances. It's just that their best wasn't good enough. And so over 200,000 people died from COVID related illnesses. The coronavirus showed up the limitations of our government, and for that matter, governments right across the world. Question is, can the same thing happen with God? Can circumstances get on top of him such that his best is not good enough and he ends up letting people down. Now, I'm sure instinctively we all know what the right answer is. No, of course not. Circumstances can't. But it might well have felt like that to the early church at the start of Acts chapter 12. For in 12 verses 1 to 3, we learn that the early church was persecuted and the likes of Peter and James were caught up in it. Uh, there are a couple of Jameses mentioned in this passage, which is a bit confusing. This is James, the brother of John, as opposed to James, the brother of Jesus. And, um, and, and Peter and James, they, they were two of the three closest friends of Jesus on earth. And yet, right at the very start here, James is killed and Peter thrown in prison. And it would be understandable, therefore, for the early church to question, is God still in control? Circumstances, they were bleak. Christians were suffering and dying. Could God be trusted? And I'm sure many of us have experienced tough times when, if we're honest, we've wondered the same thing. Maybe it's an illness. Maybe it's a financial struggle. Maybe it's a relational issue. Maybe it's a death. Maybe it's a spiritual difficulty or something else entirely. Maybe it's simply a concern that arises as we look at our country, our world, and we think, well, that seems to be succeeding in its rebellion against God. Just like Herod. Back in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. If you've ever felt like that, then the message of our passage today is, don't worry. We don't need to worry, because the truth is that God is never overwhelmed by circumstances. He's never caught off guard or limited by his abilities, unlike human kings and rulers. For God is nothing less than the all-powerful King of kings, who has everything and everyone in his hand. And that comes out actually really clear in the rest of our chapter, as we see a stark contrast between the power of Herod, the human ruler, and the power of the Lord, the King of kings. So without further ado, let's uh, jump into the chapter and see that for ourselves. And the, the first point I want us to notice is that the Lord can achieve the impossible, which is good, because at the start of our chapter, the Christians really are in an impossible situation, and King Herod, well, he really does appear to have the upper hand. Now, Herod, this Herod, is actually the grandson of Herod the Great, the one who was in power when Jesus was born. And like his grandfather, he didn't worry about a bit of institutional violence. 
Hence, he persecuted the church, had James killed, and threw Peter into prison. Actually, the only reason that Peter wasn't also killed was because he was seized on a religious holiday, and on those days, the Jews didn't permit trials or sentencing. But in verse 4, we're told that Herod intended to have a show show trial immediately following the public holiday, and that would almost certainly result in Peter's execution too. Another one down. In the meantime, before that execution, well, Herod didn't want Peter escaping, so he treated him as a Class A maximum security prisoner with four sets of four guards watching him round the clock. In fact, verse 6 indicates that Peter's wrists were manacled, a soldier was stationed each side of him, and two other soldiers stood outside his cell. So you see, this wasn't some sort of um, gentle, open prison experience for Peter. It was more like Camp X-Ray in Guantanamo Bay. And so the situation, humanly speaking, looks hopeless. Herod's murderous intentions seem irresistible. But but the church didn't give up hope. Look with me at verse 5. Verse 5 of Acts 12. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. I bet they were praying. What were they praying? Well, we're not told, but I imagine, they, I imagine they just simply cried out for a miracle. Because a miracle was what was going to be needed if Peter was to be saved. And a miracle, amazingly, was exactly what they got. In fact, what happened was way beyond their expectations. For in verses 6 to 10, we discover that, that on the very eve of Peter's trial... God organized a supernatural jailbreak. Look with me again at verses 6 to 10. Verse 6. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a bright light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison. But he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself. And they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Now, it's it's, it's absolutely no wonder, is it, that Peter struggled to grasp the reality of what was happening. His rescue has all the hallmarks of a dream. An angel telling him to get dressed. His prison chains just falling off. The guards not noticing he's leaving. Doors and gates opening by themselves. It all sounds rather improbable. Even impossible. And it wasn't just Peter who struggled to believe what was happening, but the other disciples also. There they are in in a house local to the prison, gathered having an evening prayer meeting, praying for Peter when a knock comes on the door. Who was it? Was it the secret police come to round them up? No. No. Rada, the servant girl, goes to investigate, and to her amazement, she hears Peter's voice on the other side of the door. Hello, it's me, Peter, let me in. Well, she is so excited that rather comically, she completely forgets to open the door, leaves him outside, and runs into the prayer meeting to tell the others. And she cries, Peter's at the door! At which point, the prayers open their eyes, raise their heads, look rather quizzically at her, and those very people who had just that second been praying, Lord, please save Peter, say to Rhoda, 
Nah. You're out of your mind. It can't possibly be true. You're, you're just wishing it was the case. You see, even those who knew in their heads that God was powerful enough to bring about a miracle, even they struggled to believe that he'd brought Peter back to them. It just seemed impossible. In fact, in uh, verse 15, it's clear that it was easier to believe it was a ghost or an angel rather than Peter himself. But it wasn't just Peter, and it wasn't just the disciples who were confused. It was Herod as well. Look at verses 18 and 19. Verse 18. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. I'm sure there was. After Herod had a thorough search made for him, did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Class A, maximum security prisoners, they don't just disappear. And so after an extensive search, Herod concluded, conspiracy must be afoot amongst the guards. And so he had them executed. After all, it was impossible for Peter to have escaped without help. But we, of course, know differently. For as Peter finally acknowledges in verses 11 and 17, it was the Lord who rescued him from prison. You see, the Lord really can do the impossible. And we need to remind ourselves of that truth regularly. It is easy, living in a world that is dominated by material concerns, to forget that there is a, a larger reality beyond what we can see and touch, a spiritual world in which God is king and constantly at work behind the scenes. Yeah, of course, we are sent to that on a Sunday here. We, we sing about it enthusiastically. But do we consciously recall it Monday to Friday? And do we believe, as we're told in Ephesians 3, that our God is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to His power that is at work in us? Do we? Really? If we do, it will start by showing itself in our prayer life. For if we truly believe that God's in control, if we believe that he can influence what goes on and that he can achieve the impossible, then we will turn to him regularly and we'll turn to him earnestly, like we're told the early church did. Of course, of course no one's perfect. As we've seen, the, the early church ended up praying for Peter's rescue and then struggling to believe when it happened. I think we can understand their mistake, can't we? For it's easy for all of us to underestimate the effectiveness of prayer. After all, prayer seems such a, a little thing, almost an incidental activity. And in one sense, that's true. Prayer isn't some magical force that contains great power in itself. No, prayer is simply a process of talking to our Heavenly Father, God. However, our Father to whom we talk is powerful. And therefore, if we talk to Him, if we cry out to Him, if we depend on Him and submit our requests to Him, well, we can be sure that the King of Kings, the most powerful being in the universe, listens and answers. Of course, he doesn't always act in the way we would like him to. But we can be sure he'll act in accordance with his good and perfect purposes. And if we believe this, then we will be people who pray. And who pray regularly, earnestly, and expectantly. The Lord can achieve the impossible. 
But secondly, we learn in this chapter that the Lord looks after his people. The um, COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice group have been um, protesting in and outside the COVID inquiry venue. And many of them clearly feel that the government haven't looked after the people of this country. In fact, some of them would go as far as saying that government's actions were responsible for the deaths of their loved ones. Now, whether we agree with that or not, I'm sure we'll be unanimous in our judgment upon Herod. For he was clearly directly responsible for the deaths of many. Yeah, he actively wanted it. And as such, he certainly didn't look after his people. In fact, he was more concerned about securing his own popularity rather than looking out for the interests of others, as verse 3 makes clear. But the question is, is God any different? And this is a very real question. Because so far we've been talking about how he saved Peter. But he didn't save James, did he? James was executed. So did, did God not care so much about James? Did he forget about James? Did he sacrifice him for some other end? Well, before we jump to any hasty conclusions, I want us to look back at the rescue of Peter. Because I actually think that in Peter's story, we sign some reassurances about James and everybody else who dies in Christ. You see, as we read uh, chapter 12, there are, there are resonances with another event that happened earlier. What was that event? Well, in verse 3, we're told Peter was seized during the feast of the unleavened bread. And in verse 4, the Passover is mentioned. Now, these were two feasts when God's people remembered that God had rescued them from slavery. But these feasts also occurred at exactly the time of year when Jesus was imprisoned and killed. Now, someone asked me about a timeline uh, for this uh, last week, and I couldn't quite remember. We, we think we're about 10 years on now from that. 10 years on, but at exactly this point in the calendar, Jesus was imprisoned and killed. And I think Luke, the author of Acts, deliberately mentions these feasts to get us thinking about Jesus. I say that because in verse 4, Luke writes about Herod handing Peter over to the guards. And that phrase, handing him over, or delivering him up, is exactly the same phrase that he uses on numerous occasions in his first book, Luke's Gospel, when predicting and explaining Jesus' death. What's more, did you notice, I wonder, that all of the same type of people seem to be involved in both Peter and James's imprisonment. On both occasions, there was a king called Herod. On both occasions, the Jewish leaders provided the impetus for the trial. And on both occasions, Roman soldiers guarded the prisoner. And then in, in Acts 12, verse 7, we're told that an angel came and woke Peter up. Uh, the, the phrase woke up is exactly the same phrase as lifted up. And that is the word that Luke uses for the resurrection of Jesus. So do you see, although, although Peter wasn't executed, his experience is definitely intended to remind us of Jesus. If you like, Peter has a, a near-death experience and a, a mini-resurrection experience. And this is an echo of Jesus' death and resurrection as is the subsequent disbelief of Jesus' followers. From both occasions, it was a woman who brought the disciples the good news. And on both occasions, they thought the disciples that the woman was mad or had seen a ghost. There are just too many references here for this to be an accident. 
No, the parallels between Peter and Jesus are clear, and Luke emphasizes these in order to to force our minds to think about the death and resurrection of Jesus. Why? Well, if you have a Bible, keep a finger in Acts 12, but do turn with me to Luke 21. This is his previous book, same author. Luke 21 and verse 16. It's page 1056. This is before Jesus' death and resurrection, but he's predicting what is going to happen to his disciples. And he says, verse 16, you will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. That came true, didn't it, with James? Verse 17, everyone will hate you because of me. Jesus is basically saying here, if you're connected to me, then the people who have hated me will hate you too. And you need to be prepared for that, says Jesus. You need to be prepared to follow me into death. But he says in verse 18, do you see verse 18? But not a hair of your head will perish. Now, at first glance, that sounds like a flat contradiction, doesn't it? Some of you are going to die, but not a hair of your head will perish. But it's not a contradiction because he's talking about eternal realities, as verse 19 makes clear. Verse 19, stand firm and you will win life. You'll win eternal life is what he's talking about. You see, being connected to Jesus means also being connected to his resurrection. And so his disciples can look forward to eternal life beyond the grave. And that is a great reassurance in the face of persecution and death. For Christians can be killed. Like James, we can be put in the grave. But because of Jesus, we can be sure that God will raise us to eternal life. We can be sure that God will look after us even in death. And that means we don't need to be anxious. We don't need to be anxious about James, or any other Christian, including ourselves. For thanks to Jesus, there is always hope. Even in the face of the worst that this world can throw at us, we can be sure that God will not abandon his people. He'll do his best for us. The um, the 19th century preacher Spurgeon put it beautifully when he said this, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. They shall not die prematurely, they shall be immortal till their work is done. And when their time comes to die, then their deaths will be precious. The Lord watches over their dying beds, smooths their pillows, sustains their hearts, receives their soul. I think Peter knew that. I think he knew it because did you notice in Acts 12 verse 6 that on the the eve of his trial, just before the angel turns up, We're told he was sleeping. There are very few people faced with the prospect of death the next day who wouldn't be anxious or alarmed. If we were in that situation, I doubt we'd get any sleep that night. If I think of it myself, I actually struggle to sleep when facing the most minor of issues. I can end up wrestling with those issues for hour after hour. But Peter, oh no, sound asleep. 
he must have had such calm assurance. Assurance that he was in God's loving hands. Let's pray that we might have such faith in God's control and care as he did. In that sense, I think um, calmness is a sign of spiritual maturity, isn't it? I don't know whether you're prone to panic, um, I, but I've come across people whose lives haven't turned out as they'd expected. Maybe they've become ill, or lost their job, or faced a tragedy or rejection. And in such situations, they could easily have panicked and worried about their relationship with God. Does he love me? Has he left me? What's he doing? But instead, I've, these people have exuded complete peace and calm. As they've acknowledged that whatever happens, good or bad, life or death, God still loves them and cares for them in the midst of the storm. It is a wonderful testimony, and one that I personally long for, and I hope you do too. The Lord can achieve the impossible. The Lord looks after his people. Peter escaped. James, he went to heaven. And then thirdly, the Lord has the last word. In verse 19, um, Herod turns his attention to international politics. You know, if in doubt things aren't going well domestically, let's look abroad. And that's probably an area that Herod thought he could convince himself he was important and in control. After all, states like Tyre and Sidon depended upon Herod for their food supply. So they needed him. In fact, they were so dependent that in verses 21 and 22, they said about some extreme groveling. Look with me at verse 21. Verse 21. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. These are the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they shouted, this is the voice of a god, not a man. And they were clearly trying to butter him up, weren't they? And Herod, sucker for a compliment, lapped it up. I'm sure he must have felt a bit fragile after the Peter affair. This made him feel better. Not just a man, but a God. That sounded good. That sounded like the sort of respect he deserved. But at that very moment, verse 23, immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. You see, Herod might have been a king, but he absolutely wasn't God. And he and everybody else needed to recognize that, so the Lord dealt with him and brought his reign to an abrupt an ignominious end, eaten by worms. In contrast, look with me at verse 24. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Herod's voice was cut off, but God's voice continued to ring out. Herod's kingdom was finished, but God's kingdom continued to grow. It's a familiar pattern in Acts, isn't it? We should be, be recognizing it by now. God consistently defeats his opposition. His kingdom wins. He has the last word. And that is a, a stark reminder to us, living in our self-sufficient society, that we're not actually in control. This man, who, who only a few verses earlier thought that he carried all of the cards as he held Peter's life in his hands, discovered that in reality, he didn't even hold his own life 
in his hands. You see, the truth is that we humans, we humans are not even in control of the next breath we're about to take. Our days are numbered, not by us, but by God. And therefore, it's vital, vital that we've made our peace with him. For if, like Herod, we haven't, then one day, sooner or later, God will call us to account and let none of us think that we can get away with trying to be king of our own lives forever. We can't. God will have the last word. And so please, make peace with him. Turn and accept the forgiveness that Jesus graciously offers us. And once we've done that, well, then we can be encouraged. For God is bigger than this world. He is more loving than this world. And if we have submitted Him as King, then we can be sure we are on the winning side. And he will never let us down, unlike every other human king or ruler or government. So let that inspire us, particularly the next time we're going through trials, to cast aside doubt and anxiety and instead put our trust in the King of Kings all the more. And with that in mind, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you that in this passage, the, the contrast is great between the power of human kings and rulers and your power. We thank you that you are the king of kings and that you hold everything and everyone in your hand. And we thank you that if we trust in Jesus, then we can be completely sure that despite the trials we're going through and however severe they might feel, nonetheless, you will look after us. You will achieve the impossible by bringing us safely through this world and into your heavenly kingdom. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can also be sure that you'll have the last word, both on our lives, but also the lives of those we know and love, and also the last word on everything that happens in this world. We thank you for that certainty, and we pray that it might encourage us, inspire us to trust you. And we pray this for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.